see, the trouble is, when talking about early day history, we're talking about 1915. Who the hell's alive in 1915? You know, the radio, they're not around. About 1920, myself and some other guys are still around. I hit a guy in the air the other day that uh, I, I, I was listening to him talking on CW and he said, I've been on the air for 71 years and I go, oh my God, that's pretty good. So have I. And so I call him and uh, he said, oh yeah, you're a butt bane, I know you, you know, from the magazine. Mm -hmm. At that time, uh, it was a contemporary of QST and it was known all over the world. My name, C. Farrell Bain, very distinctive name, and uh, this was remembered by a lot of people, and it still is. I, I get on the air once in a while, and uh, and somebody will say, gee, I, I visited you uh, back in uh, the uh, 20s or 30s or something, and uh, when you lived on Castro Street. You know, you really have to go back on this thing, way back to uh, to the Fleming valve. See? Well, you talked about detectors as being one of the critical gating elements. Well, that was the there. The, well, see, they were they were actually rectifiers. There were there were no vacuum tubes, and so a, a when you put a a, a metal point against a, a certain mineral like uh, carborundum or silicon or or galena. Uh, you, you then made a diode out of it, you made a one-way rectifier out of it. And earlier, before that, they, they had these carborundum uh, devices and they had a little tapper on it, like a, yeah, a belt. Yeah, right. The major breakthrough in receivers was the introduction of the, the tetrode. In other words, here was a tube that you could put ahead of a detector and, and it would amplify without oscillating. See, the triodes, when you when you try to connect a triode as an amplifier, you get feedback from, from grid to plate, and so pretty soon it works out as an oscillator. See, the regenerative detectors uh, worked on that basis, except that they they worked on a basis where, where you uh, brought the, the amplification, the feedback, up and up and up and up just before the point where it broke into to sustain oscillation. And again, you can gain, get gains of 50,000 on this thing. Jeez. See, the, the interspersed in here were uh, super generative. It's a, it's a horrible, noisy thing, but big gain. Well, see the first five meter stuff and all, the amateur stuff when we uh, came back, when we were on five meters, uh, we were using uh, super regenerative uh, detectors they, at, at, for the high frequencies. But the point was that the regenerative detector, see, in 19, from 1922 or whatever, as soon as the tubes were available, then the regenerative, I guess Armstrong was the, had the regenerative patent, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And then DeForest tried to sue. Armstrong and uh, of course the no one uh, wants to really talk about De Forest, you know. The, he was a, supposedly is a great name and all. Uh, I have different opinions on that. A lot of a lot of people, historian types, will uh, will you'll find have different opinions. Well, he was a promoter, and, and you know, and that that was his way of life, I guess, and that. That was as, it. As an engineer, I think he was very shallow. Well, I don't, you know, I should, I shouldn't say that because I really don't know. Yeah. But I, from what I've, uh, the the talk that I've heard, as, see, as an example in terms of the vacuum tube. Well, I, I remember in that in that broadcast, uh, Empire of the Air, mm -hmm. they talked about him being on the witness stand when he was trying to sue Armstrong for the uh, uh, patent on the regeneration. He was on that witness stand for three hours, and in that three hours, he could not explain the concept of regeneration. Uh, but, but to me, you know, having worked uh, worldwide, and say from about 1925, uh, worked 
stationed throughout the world with, with two tube receiver, regenerative detector in one stage of audio, and then with a transmitter that was only just a single tube. It was, it was an oscillator. And later on, as, as more uh, larger tubes became available, uh, there were bigger oscillators, and then finally the concept came of using another tube to drive it as an amplifier, I'll say, but all of these were, were phases that came along little by little. To me, the tetrode, which incidentally was under development during World War I, I'm sure, but it, then they, were, they became commercially available in, uh, in the, uh, oh, about 1930. All this problem of all these tubes with special circuits and all neutralizing circuits, there were triodes, see? And so the, the need of, an, uh, so to speak, of a non-oscillating triode uh, that would be self-sufficient self as a tube was, was very much in, in, in evidence. See, they, they, were, they were two radio frequency receivers. They were not, they were not superheterodynes, see? And so they were, they were tuned to RF stages ahead of a, of a detector and then an audio. Well, from an operator standpoint, mm -hmm. what were the biggest problems with the uh, TRF receivers? Well, they never did exist in the amateur ranks. They were all broadcast oh. things, see. And so that some technician set the thing up for you, and the, if it didn't oscillate, well, that was fine. Then you got all the... They were sensitive, you know, you take a... Uh, you, you can get very high gains with, with uh, RF stages. See, and so, but the point then with the RF stage, it, uh, the, then the regenerative detector went out. See, with regenerative detectors, when you, when you, when you brought up the, the, the feedback on a thing, if you brought it up too far, the thing would break into oscillation. See, so when you're trying to listen to somebody, all of a sudden it starts, then it's going into oscillation, see. Then when the superhead came in, there, there were many, many problems to be solved on that. Uh, image was a big problem. It was a big problem with super well, What, From a design standpoint, what were the advantages that the super hat offered as compared to state-of-the-art? Well, it offered selectivity to begin with. That's a primary thing. See, with the TRF stage, you, you had, uh, at the best, two, two tuned circuits. And they, uh, the cues of these things, because of loading and all, were not too high, and so the selectivity was not too great. So the, when the superhead came along, the, the 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 principal advantage of it, as I see it, and is that that it became very selective. See, but uh, introducing selectivity, what they did, the first superheads, the early superheads went up to uh, with higher frequencies of maybe. 50 kilohertz. Well, so the image was twice that frequency. So that when you were tuning in there, tuning out over the band, it's hard to tell whether you were actually receiving the final metal or the image because it was only 100 kilohertz off. It was just twice the I off, the uh, the I the I frequency plus or minus 50. But the selectivity was tremendous. So you it was it was a kind of a trade off there, and then. Uh, by by stand they, they find that they they had to get the IF up in a, in a in, in a higher frequency so they came up to standardize on four four sixty five was the original frequency and then they changed it to four fifty six and then the columns went over into five hundred when they came out one of the things that you can find out here is to search the early QST the ads and see. So it had what? Uh, bear in mind now that there were manufacturers of, of receivers, but there were people like Greeby and Coley B. Kennedy and those people made beautiful mechanical things. But uh, the, as an example, on the, on, the, on the early receivers that was used on Spark, uh, to get a variation in, in frequency, they used variometers, which uh, uh, uses the one inductor turning around so that the fields either add or, or subtract, but the, 
if you stop and think about it, in order to do that, you had to have twice the amount of wire than you'd have if you only had one coil, because the uh, of the, the rotor had the same amount of relatively the same amount of turns as the stator had. So the Q of the variometer then is very low. So you're defeating Q Q or, or width bandwidth. The pretty uh, bandwidth is pretty much a function of Q. Is a function of Q. And so the variometer is not a not a high Q device inherently, say, or a, a variable coupler, which would mean another uh, one coil with another coil uh, working on it, it, angular uh, coupling either in or, or out, bucking or aiding, say, so that there was there was need, there was great need of, of much, much selectivity because, again, on those old receivers, like for instance back on the Spark or some of the early receivers, if a strong signal came on the air, well, he, he just took the band over. Spark, of course, was so broad anyway, so that when, when, when fellows came in, everybody had to quit. And of course, there were a lot of high power sparks came on, and they, uh, uh, there was a lot of hard feelings on uh, the spark days, leading to fist fights and more, down, cutting down antennas and a lot of other things that went on. And then, when Lamb developed the thing for the amateur, it, it was a steady improvement. Oh, see, another another factor entered into the thing, and that is the stability of, of oscillators. See, oscillator stability was, was a real hard problem because again, uh, the, the 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 frequency was dependent upon. Uh, uh, expansion or contraction of of, the, of an inductor, the expansion or contracting of the plates in a variable capacitor. Uh, some of the during the stages on this thing, uh, negative coefficient uh, opposite moving one way opposite to the way the thing was was naturally moving. So we did in in our manufacturing business to develop. Uh, an oscillator that uh, had a minimum of of drift, we uh, wound uh, our inductors on glass core, uh, coil forms, which had a very low coefficient of expansion. So that then uh, it was possible actually to uh, build a variable capacitor, difficult but possible, so that that the expansion occurred. In, in two ways, so the, the second way tended to come to uh, uh, not nullify the, the first way, so, so that uh, then th there were so many problems, technical problems in these things. Variable capacitors alone. See again, if you have a, just a semicircular thing, why then you, you don't you, you don't have a uh, it, it it will not. The band spread it; it'll all pile up and then open up. Whereas the other way, when you when you change the the shape of the place of the variable capacitor, you can then get a straight line or a fairly linear response rotation versus frequency. As I recall, it works something like on the square, the square. I'm sure it works on a square basis. So that the thing, instead of being linear, uh, being uh, linear as it goes along, it, it, it changes as the square of, of the rotation. So the straight line, straight line frequency capacitor, of which I've designed a few, and during the war we had to uh, build our own variables because it was we couldn't get them, and so our engineers worked out the uh, plate shapes of these things experimentally. The model shop took the mathematics of the things and. Shape the plates on it to uh, get it to the point where it was was straight line frequency. So this goes on and on and on.